Hey, I'm Aeon. And I'm the Lioness. And you're listening to Box Number 512 Podcast. Grown Black Trans Woman Talk. Changing your world one conversation at a time. The show begins now. Welcome to another installment of Box Number 512 Podcast, Grown Black Trans Woman Talk. I am Aeon. And I'm the Lioness. So let's start with a light update. Uh, I am doing okay. I'm having a better week. Work is still very heavy, but I have a lot of interesting projects coming up getting ready for the holidays. Also, a lot of my furniture has come into my home. I just ordered a couch. Hopefully, this will be the last thing I'm ordering from my apartment for now, but my couch is supposed to be here on Friday. For those of you who don't, who don't know, I've been having issues with trying to order furniture. Um, first, it was a delay, and then the second time when my furniture actually got here, my couch was too big to come through the front door, so I had to send the furniture back, and girl, so it, it's really been a process in a testing of my patience, but I'm happy to say that good things come to those who wait. Um, I'm happy to have my furniture. I need to buy a new work desk and a new chair for me to work in. All of that will come in time. But again, I'm just thankful that I had my own place and I had my things and that I am enjoying my space. And that's all the update I got for right now. What's going on with you, sis? No tea, no tea. Um, Holidays are approaching. Um, I was, part of me was, um, um, well, we've already, we went and booked our travel. I will be doing the holidays in Florida. And so, um, we booked a nice pet friendly little place on a lake. And so just to give us a little chill time, we're going to be there for a full week. And so that'll be exciting. Um, other than that, um, just one day at a time, um, you know, trying to, work on I had in my own podcast we had an episode with men like us founder Chris Patterson and I really really enjoyed him and the conversation and the feedback and the views on my um, podcast the lioness still lives conversation with the black trans goddess my own personal podcast the views are an all-time high which is exciting um, and just in general just thinking about like what I want to wear for Halloween. (laughs) Like, even though there's a strong chance of me going absolutely nowhere, somehow this year it feels important to me to be festive. Like to find a reason to be excited about something. Um, But I'm not, I probably won't spend any money. So it's more of getting ideas of what I can put together for a nice little Halloween photo shoot that I'm having with myself. So just just trying to find some little like kiki moment of joy to like promote the holidays and the platforms and stuff. So, you know, just one day at a time, Um, you know, as with we'll talk, I'm sure about later in the podcast, you know, going into holidays, it's always mixed feelings for me. It's a mixed bag, darling. But for overall, I'm this year more than I've ever really been. I'm actually kind of looking forward to to not necessarily the holidays, but like the the community and the fellowshipping that it'll bring. Believe it or not, you start missing niggas you'd rather not see usually. And so <laughs> I am having that bit of nostalgia, but I also think about like some of the separations in my own family. And so then, you know, the holidays are always a little awkward for that reason. So, but yeah, girl, so overall, no, no tea, no tea, no, you know, no problems. Oh, also, shout! Out, I want to give a shout out to my friend um, Armani, um, who was in town over the weekend, and we went to brunch. Um, probably one of my only black cis um, het male friends. Um, I worked with him a couple of summers ago at a law firm, and just like a really, really like great person, like great person. Um, 
no like weird energy, especially when it comes to like cis het black men who can be really weird. Like just really um great energy. Somebody who I think is going to do a lot of great things in and out of the legal world. But it was really great catching up with him and having um brunch with him and he's younger than me. So just being able to give him advice and just to know that like somebody like that like looks up to me in that way. Um, that, you know, that makes me feel good about myself. So um, shout out to him. Also, may, girls and boys everywhere, please make sure you are registered to vote. Yeah. Need everybody to vote. I meant to bring this up on the last episode, but um, yeah, just we need everybody voting, whether your name is changed, whether it's not, whether your gender marker is changed, whether your gender marker is not. We need folks to vote. Like, this election is no joke. If you can vote early, I highly suggest you vote early instead of waiting until election day because this administration is getting really bangy cunt with the girls and they're actively trying to suppress um, our constitutional right to vote. So um, please vote. Um, Is it also rumored to be true that he's saying now that the bailout money won't be issued out until after he's elected? So kind of putting people in this catch-22 of if you don't elect me, you won't get no money. But the thing is, if we don't elect him and we get um, Joe Biden and him up in there, we could probably get more money than that measly 1200 that he was going to give us. Boom. And that's why I brought it up because I feel like people needed an answer to that question. Well, man, I don't want to mess up this bailout coming out. No, 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 sweetie. If you reelect him, then we can, you can get a bailout that is much, much better. That's and, pl- and please know that they're in the process of giving these big businesses another round of million dollar bailouts. So they can, they can rush that through, but this $1,200 that is really less than what all of us really need. They're trying to wait until January to get no we it's no it's no shade we got to get him up out of there because like we everybody is really in danger so i really um impress upon y'all to vote make sure you're registered to vote check your registration to see if it's still active because um some states especially states that are um heavily um into voter suppression are purging um voter registrations so just um check your status make sure you're registered i know i just switched my id over so i'm in the process of being um registered to vote me and my sister tona are going to go vote early together because we happen to live in the same county so um yeah i know that in my home state of south carolina there's some verification issues right now with the state trying to require there be a witness to a ballot um i can't i can't confirm that um to say if it's true or not but what i can say is a lot of these red states are going above and beyond to try to create all of these arbitrary um restrictions for people to show up and vote on election day yeah so so it's a lot going on y'all so that's why it's so important that you do what you can now that you actually if you don't know how to river how to register to vote just google vote and i promise you there will be men their sources will come up to help you register and and it's most important is that your vote makes it to the voting office and so whatever area or jurisdiction that you live in be sure to find the most expedient method of making sure that your vote gets there. If that means you have to go vote early in places that allow that, then do take advantage of that also. But if you have to mail in a ballot, it, you know, I've, I've heard the advice given to drop it off at the post office itself and not have to rely on someone possibly tampering with it in your mailbox. Just do all the little things you can to make sure that it gets where it needs to be because we need the vote. Right. And it, and if somebody is actively trying to suppress your vote, there are a lot of grassroots organizations that um, you can call and reach out to to report that um, your vote is being suppressed because they should not be doing that. They should not be throwing voter um, actual ballots away. And like they're trying to do, don't believe the hype that our vote doesn't count. 
because they're doing everything in their power to make sure our vote doesn't count. So we got to get out here and vote. And we got to get Trump out of office because you see, he don't even care about the people around him. Everybody is get, is a new person sick every day. So we, like, girl, we well, just did we him. Did we address him getting COVID on the last episode? Well, this this was recent, but I'm I'm pretty sure everybody knows now that um him and everybody in his crew are popping up positive for um COVID nineteen, and it and it's it, it speaks to the recklessness, and it's like if you're the president and you can't even keep yourself safe from this very serious um illness, then what does that say about the rest of the country? Also, it also speaks to his level of ineptitude because this is the thing you actively denied and mocked in the very and, and mocked it in the very debate that sh- that he had right before he tested positive the, the night before. So it's just interesting. <laughs> and then this- you speak and trying to hold in a cough like, girl, get out of here. Get out of here, please. <laughs> <laughs> It is, it is, it is, it is, a, it is a comedy, and this is not me laughing at the severity of, because I am aware that these are dark times. This is actually very depressing that that man is in charge of our country, and that is, and that if we don't get out to vote, his tactics may allow the electoral college to give make way for him once again. So that's why we have to get out and vote. But on the on the other side of that, I do think there is a comedy in in him in it happening exactly the worst way possible under a man that we know has the inability to handle things so it's just there's a comedy there's an ironic comedy in him denying it and then everyone around him being falling victim to it and the gag will be is if everybody doesn't pull out and somebody actually dies and so then that's what i think is going to happen i think i don't think it's him that's going to die i think it's going to be somebody around him or somebody in the senate because they're saying how a lot of these senator senators especially the ones that have interviewed this new supreme court pick are testing positive they i think one of them going to mess around and die and, and fuck all that sending your prayers up for him i'm not wasting my prayers on him who I am praying for are the essential workers that have no choice but to be around um, the maids, the butlers, all of those people, the um, security guard. That's who I'm praying for because they can't, you know, they, they can't help. Gonna allow them the luxury of being able to say they can't work for him. Exactly. That's who I'm praying for. I'm not wasting my prayers on him and his family. I'm not doing I'm not doing it. That's who I'm praying for the essential workers that have no choice whose who whose livelihood depends on them showing up at work every day well you know i think that's an interesting distinction i feel like um not enough not enough is talked about about the support staff around him who most of are black and brown. life may have been their simple goal in life may have just been to work for the government and they rose in the ranks and took what they felt was a very privileged position working in the white house but unfortunately they're having to work in this privileged position that they work their life to get under a man that doesn't even respect the institution at all and so then think about every day those people that are having to be like you say the staff the real support staff the admins the people that are actually writing and typing the speeches and the thing people that are actually coming up with this stuff and they're not necessarily in alliance with him they or even basic than that, the people that are cooking his meals and cleaning That's what I'm saying, clothes. the chefs, right. the butlers, yes. The actual essential people to his life that are that can't not be there, but that are required to be subjected to his idiocy, that don't even agree with his politics, that may actually be just a regular rank and mile person, but they just having to work for him. And like, I think not enough is said because to now, we live in an era that's so polarized and people unfortunately have reached a level of just ignorance about how politics work that they'll judge somebody for even working in the white house right and, and them people them people stay there no matter what president is there exactly that's what i'm trying to say that's a whole separate career path that's not political that a lot of those people try to embark on and i feel like they get unfairly judged sometimes so shout out to those essential workers yeah the people so. the nurses and motherfuckers that's having to be exposed to his crazy ass that's having to ride with him in close quarters in a thing so he can pretend like he okay and a double proof SUV that doesn't let gases get in, and you know, ain't nothing getting out. <laughs> <laughs> so there's no fresh air in this bitch. No. For all of us, and you know he's not shutting the fuck up. You know he's not shutting the fuck up. <laughs> 
he's coughing loudly without the mask on, bitch. Yeah, so that that's who I that's who I'm praying for. I I can't wait. We gotta get him out. Of, we gotta we gotta vote. We gotta vote early if you can. I apologize for the girls living in states like Alabama, the South Carolinas, the Arkansas, because though the in Texas because those governors are, are is really hard for the girls to vote in those states. It's really buck. Um, but you know, if you can go out and vote early, go ahead and do it and beat the lines and just do it so your your vote because that's what I'm planning to do, girl. I, I can't wait another minute. But turning to you, like the first available opportunity, I same. Um same. Cause I I I would hate because I know in my state in particular, I am in one of those states that is very highly prone to fuck up in this our last election with um that denied Stacey Abrams the governorship and it was a completely a sham and we found all kinds of evidence of voter fraud and suppression and so just to be transparent I'm nervous about this election because even in the midterm elections at, at the at my polling place there was old oh, machines not working and you have to put it in in the machine but then you print it out and then you scan it here but before you scan it, it after you scan it it gets shredded so it's like no real like it was it was some intense shit happening and I was very um nervous about that process in the midterm hopefully they've gotten rid of some of the kinks but actually from what they've been saying on the news even with the way they're closing precincts and the way they're switching and gerrymandering things now it it's going to be really hectic so they're really encouraging which is the result of a supreme court decision by the way really explain that well you know what i can say in a nutshell is um we the congress whatever congress comes in we need to restore the voting rights act because it's been seriously eroded and there was a decision that came out like in 2013 so voting rights act there is a i can't remember the name but there's a certain section that if states take actions to um create new rules um, for voting or new requirements for voting that it must survive like strict scrutiny uh-huh. and basically with the Supreme Court case I can't remember the name of it right now is basically it took rid it, it got rid of it it basically got rid of that provision so now state like so if a state wants to um, and this was a case that actually originated in Alabama so basically if a state wants to close down a voting precinct, they no longer have to survive strict scrutiny to close it down. They can just go ahead and do it. Just like in t- a couple of days ago in Texas, how for, because we've been having record numbers from old, early voting, um, mm-hmm. and in Texas, um, I think his name is Rick Abbott, the governor just um, created a new rule to only have one drop-off box per county. And because of this Supreme Court precedent, he yes. can do that because he doesn't have to demonstrate um, how how that is a compelling interest for him. He doesn't have to survive strict scrutiny to do that. So, and you know how big the fucking counties in Texas are to have one drop off box. Like, so so basically, the law allows governors, particularly gov- like red state governors, to create all of these loopholes to suppress um suppress to engage in voter suppression. And they and there's no checks, there's no balances, there's no you can't go and sue the state and make them prove anything because of that Supreme Court case law. It made it easier for them to avoid that hurdle and just go ahead and do the action and not be checked. Exactly. You know, and I'm gonna say this: I have the utmost, I have the utmost respect for what the Supreme Court and what they do. But I think we, as a people, as a culture, need to remember that the Supreme Court only really, like, gets involved at the end of the food chain. Like, interestingly enough, because the decisions that they make are so sweeping, they don't get involved in things like what happens in Congress and the way that Congress uh, changes these laws. So if you listen to what she said just then, Congress actually allow something that was an integral to the voting rights act to not to no longer be included and because of that all of this stuff is happening and a case eventually went to the supreme court but we have to remember that the root is in the people that we elect that are not the president 
And for those of you who right now who may be listening that are saying, I don't really want Trump or Biden. I think you need to also remember that beyond your responsibility to vote for president, you also have a civic duty to allocate where money, resources, and time and energy go. And that's determined by these elected officials. And in situations where you have a Republican held Congress, that does not necessarily is not invested in empowering the the people that aren't supporting whiteness and 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 and, and capitalism well then you'll be a, you'll end up in a place where they'll do things to erode laws that already exist and put us in a situation like where we are now where voting voting booths can be just closed at any at will that there can be one drop off box per county like we have to remember that it's more than just the president that we're voting for. And it's, it's, it's more important, actually, that you are voting for all of these other characters to make sure that they're in alignment. Because what we saw in, with President Obama is that a president without the support of his Congress can be muted to a lot of the change he wants to have. Though we voted for change, Congress was able to block that change because there wasn't a supportive Congress. In this election, regardless of who's going to be there, we want to make sure that Congress is also in alignment with whoever the president, with what, what our values are and not what the president's ideal is, be it, be it Biden or be it, but be it um, Joe, Joe um, excuse me, be it Biden or be it Trump. We oh, yeah. Make, because like, once Joe Biden sure gets in. Remember to connect to the, connect to those local officials because that's what matters more. Yeah, it all it all matters. It even and you know we have a lot of conversations about the federal Supreme Court, but we also need to be invested in the Supreme Court of our the various states where we come from, and that mm-hmm. is that is in part from that plays is in part from the governor elections. Like the governor, the state governors are appointing the state Supreme Courts. So you know we like we like we need, and I I really hope like the language around people who are doing the work on the ground to get people invested and re and reinvigorated about voting, that there is a language that encompasses that this is a cyclical thing. It's a continuous thing. It can't just be this um, one time act that happens every four years. It needs to happen every time an election comes around from the federal um, to the state. And like you said, the, like the Congress and the House of Representatives, that stuff matters. So that way, we're not, we're not leaving it up to this politicized Supreme Court to interpret like these laws from 1965. We can just rely on the Senate and the House of Representatives to, per, to pass even more progressive, um, um, statutes that, um, that um that strengthen that strengthen the older statues that we already have. So um hopefully we can get the John Lewis um Voting Rights Act passed. Hopefully we can get the Equality um Act passed. Like we need all of these things um passed because if not um we're we're left up to this heavily heavily politicized Supreme Court to um interpret these old statutes. That, that have been gutted, you know, throughout the years, and we don't need that. We don't need that. So, y'all, please go vote. <laughs> like, please go. Like, this is not a game. Like, this is not a game. Um, so, going from one topic to the next topic. So, I so I I made a post. I made a post yesterday. Um, and let let's get some backstory behind the post. So, a couple of months ago, at the end of July. The Emmy nominations came out, and of course, everybody was upset because Angelica Ross, who played Candy in FX's Pose, was not nominated um, for her performance, particularly in um, episode number four from the second season, Never Knew Love Like This Before. She should have been nominated. I personally think she should have won an award. I thought her performance in the acting was great, but... As a result of that story, somebody reached out to me from ID Magazine to write, um, to write about the story and what, you know, why it was an issue and what that, what that meant. And I had like a two day turnaround to turn in a story. And I was, I was, I was, the promise was to be paid. Like we, I signed a contract and um, there was an invoice. So I was not doing this for free. And let me say this, 
I am not that type of writer. This was just like a one-off thing. Somebody asked me to do it, and I, you know, I did it to the best of my ability. So and I think you did a wonderful job. Thank you. So, you know, the story came out like at the very end of July. Um, I was supposed to be back pay. I sent my invoice over. And let me say this, I purposely did not send my actual bank account because um, the, the particular magazine is headquartered overseas. And, you know, I'm just very careful with my actual bank information that I send over. So I'm a girl, I have a, a cash app, a PayPal, a Venmo, a Z- like I have all of that. And those things have account numbers on there and I sent it on over. So for the past two months, it's kind of been like this ping pong back and forth. and on my end, when I haven't heard anything back, I'm usually the one that has to initiate the conversation about when am I getting paid? And, you know, because I'm somebody that works and I'm not a freelancer, girl, I was going to let it go. Right. You know, I was going to let it go because, you know, you know, it's not that big of a deal. But something told me just to reach out one more time. And this is, this is my thing a couple of things I want to say you I should have had I should have have to like reach out or chase after you or um to get paid or to rectify the situation behind me getting paid when there was not this lag of time with me delivering my work that's my first thing two I just didn't like the 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 lack of care or the lack of urgency about getting me paid or the lack of urgency about figuring out why some numbers didn't go through or the lack of urgency about trying to figure out different alternatives to me getting paid. And my third point, which is probably the main reason why I went public about this, we when you when you are specifically asking um, people from a marginalized community, particularly Black people, particularly Black trans people, particularly Black trans women, right? You need to make sure that they are getting paid or that the paths to them getting paid are easy and they don't need to go through a thousand different hurdles to get paid. Like, y'all know the the levels of employment discrimination that we deal with. Y'all know the levels of poverty that we deal with. Y'all know the levels of marginal, marginalization that we deal with. So if you are from a company or from an org and you're going out of your way to find this talent because you need this perspective and this is trendy or whatever, you need to keep that same energy when it comes to paying them or to getting them their money. I, as the Black trans person, should not have to be reaching out to you, coming after you to get paid for my labor. And the, and this is not even just limited to this magazine. This is just any time that you have these big companies that want edge or want spice and they want the work fast, but then they drag their feet with the money. And then sometimes with the money, they're not even paying you with your work. And so that's the deeper offense of it, sis. The deeper offense is oftentimes in our zeal and our verve to want to have the conversation, we'll actually do the work for the work's sake and do things that we really should get, be, be getting paid more for, for less, devaluing our own real at work as academics just simply because we believe in the cause and people will take advantage of that. And then now with the money you said you were going to give me, you're making it difficult for me to get even more of an insult to injury. Right. So I just, and the, the reason that I came public because I've heard stories from other black trans and queer creatives that, you know, similar things have happened to them. So I'm like, so this is a pattern. And, you know, that's not that's not right. And I know they just had their spread like a couple of weeks ago that had the trans, the group of trans women from New York on there. Shout out to them. But, you know, it's one thing to have us on the cover of your magazine, but it's a whole different thing to actually pay us when we work for y'all and to pay us on time. So somebody from the the higher ups reached out to me today hopefully the situation 
because I went public and the you know the girls was talking and putting two the two together or tagging ID, um, you know you know that's when the head of the head of the head reaches out to you because you know they want to clear everything up. So hopefully the situation is resolved. Um, we were able to exchange information. Hopefully I will be getting my payment soon. Um, because if not, you know, we can take it to another level. But you know, I'm you know I'm trying to be positive and but. The 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 fact of the matter remains is it's two months and I still haven't been paid. So two you know, months is a long time, sis. Right, and even, especially, especially in a pandemic. Time, that's very offensive. Especially in a pandemic. Exactly. Yeah. So that's very offensive. That's very. And I'm sorry you're having to go through that. But as a creative, I feel like a lot of times we get we we get overlooked, and people think that we we should be grateful for things that we're giving you at a discount. And so I think it's important to always, um, I saw something online recently that said, when, when you do something for someone, always invoice them with your real price and let them see the discount so they know how much you're really worth. Like they were like, you know, like when you do things, they say always invoice, even if it's for free, always invoice. And even if you discount it to zero, let them see what your real value is. And I feel like not necessarily that you have to do that all the time physically with, with people, but I do believe you need to keep that in mind, like making sure that people understand what the value is, but that you're willing to accept. Cause sometimes people will, if you don't tell them, they won't know and they will, or they think you stupid and you don't know. And right. I sometimes have found it very helpful in negotiations to be like, and I've done the research and I know that this is what, this is what I should be getting. However, I will accept whatever, whatever. And you know, and a lot of times people will come back with more money after I've called, called them out on it. So just keep that in mind too. Right. But yeah, well, yeah, I, they should be paying you. Bottom line, they should. Yeah, be so I should be, I should be getting my my payment within a couple of days. But you know, I hate that I had to like, even though I was professional, I still hate that I had to kind of, you know, for lack of a better term, show my ass to get what I was owed. Ain't that it? And that makes it even up that much less sweet when you get it, because it's like I had to show out for it. So now you can go with this narrative that I'm difficult, but bitch, it ain't that I'm difficult. It's that you're trying to play passive aggressive. Where the fuck is my money? Right. So, like I said, I hope the situation is resolved. But like I said, I mainly did that for the other black um, LGBT creators I know who I know they are freelance, and I know they don't want to rock the boat, and I know you know. I'm in a position because that's not my main bread and butter. You know, I could rock the boat a little bit because, you know, I have a study check coming in every week. And like I said, I'm not that type of writer. But, you know, I did that for the other people in community because we we always getting taken advantage of. For sure. We always getting taken advantage of for our content, for our, you know, for our stuff. It's like, ha- have, the ch- have the check ready for me before you even ask me to do the favor. And that's how I'm. That's how I'm keeping it going forward. Cause you just can't. You can't. And and this is not even for white people, girl. Black people do this. You seen mm-hmm. the stories about? Um, I can't remember one of the you know legendary black magazines. It was a whole scandal about how for years they weren't paying their writers. So you know this isn't oh, just wow. something limited to white people or like everybody. Try, you know does this, but as far as we're more vulnerable. So it's more easy for them to, you know, do it to us because a lot of us are trying to be put on, but girl, you, y- y'all mess with the wrong one. I, if you took, now I was willing to write it for free, but y'all the ones that wanted the price. And since we, since there was an offer and there was an acceptance and there was a price, girl, I want the price. Exactly. So like I said, hopefully the situation will be resolved in the next couple of days and we can move on. So, um, speaking of conflicts, I don't know of those of you who watch Real Housewives of Potomac. Um, I, you know, I do. I've been, I've been in and out for the past couple of seasons, but um, this season um, has really been centered around the conflict between Monique and Candace. And there was an altercation that happened like an episode or two ago, and then this Sunday. Um, 
Monique tried to explain herself and she had like a meeting with the ladies minus Candace and they were really trying to, um, with the exception of Cameron and Ashley, the other ladies was really trying to do this respectability politics thing, which like girl by this is reality TV, but, um, yeah, so the, there was a fight and people have been taking sides. Um, I'm team Monique. But I am somebody that can, you know, acknowledge that both parties played a part. Well, in now explain your team, Monique, for those so that people get an idea of what you mean when you say team Monique. Why? Okay, so Monique let's the just break, so, so just in general terms, let's break down. Wasn't Monique right the aggressor? Um, I think Monique was the physical aggressor, but they <laughs> both were um adding flames to the. A few also the fight. I know, bitch. I'm just being funny. <laughs> like, but no, so, you're like, so let's break down why they're beefing. Um, yeah. Monique, Candace, two castmates on the show. They started off cool, like Candace's first season. Last season, season four, it was rocky between them. So the center of the con- the conflict this year is there have been rumors that Monique has been cheating on her husband. Monique's married to like an ex NFL football player. There's rumors that Monique was cheating on her husband with her trainer, and they've been spreading rumors that her youngest son is not is the train is really her son by the trainer and not oh, by her. Now husband. that's some deep shit now. Right. So that's so been going Monique, around. That is the one that's the alleged um and philanderer. Huh? Is Monique the philanderer? Yeah. So the reason that Monique is mad at Candace this season is that Candace befriended, um, I can't remember her name, but she befriended another um, lady who used to be a cast member the first two seasons of of the show. Candace is being painted that Candace went out of her way to befriend this lady. I can't remember her name right now. who, Who was the main one spreading the rumors about Monique? and his trainer and Candace because Candace and Monique was on the outs Candace was being sneaky and went out of her way to befriend this lady as get back to Monique um so that has caused conflict between them which um boiled over in the the episode before last where Candace um Candace had brought up something about how Monique had acted like she was asleep and didn't want to say bye to her. And then it created an argument between them. And then Candace kept on saying, well, drag me and drag me. Well, drag me then, drag me then, and drag me. And sis got drug. And um, yeah, it was... Now that you pointed out like that, sis, I, I, yeah, you can't ask for the dragging. Right. Now, now let me say this. I think they, I think they are both equally responsible for the fight. Um, mm. You can't like, you can't, especially when you see somebody is feeling some type of way or they're plucked. You can't go like provoking people, especially provoking people in that way, and then cry. I don't know why she put her hands on me and that, like. Sis, you were in the corner eating crumpets and drinking tea, girl. Like you were, like you were, you. Not only were you egging this one girl, you're not going to convince me that you're not that dumb to where you don't know of any conceivable reason of why this lady wouldn't have a beef with you. Like you, prefer, you're befriending, you're friends with the lady that's spreading this rumor about her, a very like horrible rumor, and she don't like you. Like that, you know, it's not. You know, it's very logical for me. Now, one thing I will say from knowing you, sis, is that you are very sensitive to people and their allegiances. And <laughs> right, just knowing, it's just like, like it's it, about it, who you align with. Because see, if you're saying you're my friend, then how is it that you are miraculously now friends with somebody that is trying to do damage to my family? Right, and it, and from the picture that they're painting on TV, it wasn't like you were friends with her before. This is a new friend that you went and made. It wasn't like y'all was all girlfriends from the block and now you're in the middle. Like, no, you just, you met this lady after we fell out. But, you know, also Monique, it's like, mama, if you, like, you sis, there was a clear barn door open behind you. At any point, you could have just walked away and you could have been like, you know what, little girl, I'm paying this, I'm going home. 
I'm going home to my kids. You know, like, sis, you could have walked away. You came up on her. You flipped her hair. Like, hey, like, you blacked out. Like, sis, like, sis we can't be blacking out on TV. And not, and not only because, and I don't, I'm not coming from the respectability politics angle. It's like, sis, I don't want you to get locked up. And lose they gonna get you this. <laughs> like there's too many cameras around for you to be acting this foolishly. Right. But like, like, you know, me being from Baltimore, I kind of appreciate a good dragging. And can like I don't hate Candace, but like Candace, like from what I've seen on TV, she's annoying. She's an annoying girl. And sometimes, sometimes girls need to be knocked. Like that's how you handle that. But um Aside, you know, the fight happened, and fights happen on reality TV. Like it, like this is not like Iyanla fix my life, even though sometimes fights happen on air. But like this is reality TV, an ensemble cast where they like the whole premise of the show is conflict amongst the cast members. The cast. Exactly. This is this is not Sesame Street, or this is not you know a show on the Food Network where we are baking cookies and sharing recipes like. Like, y'all had a conflict, y'all had bad blood, and then y'all are at an event drinking wine, getting drunk. Like, so fast forward to the episode that came on Sunday where Monique, um, and shout out to Cameron um, for being a real friend. And even during the fight when Giselle and Robin were trying to, like, do the, oh, she is violent and she's ghetto, talking about Monique. Cameron's like, what we're not going to do is we're not, we not doing it. We we are not doing that. These are two girls that are having a fight. It's not all this black women and the and yeah you, you gotta keep your head up and keep your neck tight. Like no, girl, we are not doing that. So <laughs> fast forward to the next episode. Monique um gets Karen to help her orchestrate a sit down with all of the girls so she can explain herself minus Candace and. Giselle came in there like really doing the most. Like, girl, like is I don't know. I'm gonna be honest. I get like a lot of colorism tees from like um Giselle and Robin Makes and just how they're um handling how they're handling Monique. Oh. Like it's a lot of colorism that I, you know, I'm just turned off from. But um, Giselle came in there looking tacky once again with a bodyguard, given how she's so scared and she doesn't feel comfortable around Monique and sh- her daughters should be ashamed of her. Like doing oh. the most, talking about her and Jamal Bryant have a reputation to uphold. Like Jamal Bryant. Really? The the nigga that the nigga that cheated on you before and during your ma- marriage, Ooh. the nigga that had kids out of wedlock during your marriage, that's like that nigga. <laughs> like girl, you're you're more mad at her for being violent than a nigga who is going out having unprotected sex with strange women and then coming home sleeping back to sleeping with you and getting back with you. Like you're more scared of Monique than the danger that's in your own bed. Okay, so you read, bitch. Like you're like you're do like you're doing the absolute most. Like it's like it's not it's not that deep, especially when a couple of seasons ago you and Robin rolled up on Ashley at her kangaroo bar and was like stepping up to her, like trying to like girl, so like stop with the oh don't play girl. delicate now. Right. Oh, th- this is just bad and for our image and, 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 and like, girl, what image? Your daughters are scared of Monique, girl. Your daughters are scared of Jamal. Your daughters don't like Jamal from, from the from the footage that I've seen. So, girls, so Giselle and her antics, she ended up leaving early. And it's like, sis, your money for your security guard that you rented for the two hours, that could have been better spent into, like, hiring a new, like, stylist and hairstylist. I'm just going to say that. Ooh, girl, it's a chop. You know, it's it's really shade when you, like, are born and you're light-skinned and green, with green eyes and long hair and you dress that. Like, I, I'm just going to say it. Like, how do you have those type of advantages and like still manage to not be impressive? Right. 
So yeah, I just didn't like that. And like I said, shout out to Karen, because Karen, because Karen was holding Monique accountable, but Karen was like, Monique is still my friend and we're not throwing her away. Like we're not, you know, we're not letting the like we're not going to do that. And like again, this is a real housewife franchise. This is not like the first um the like the first ladies club or like something to want own or something like girl this is this is real housewives y'all fight y'all get into it y'all start shit but this whole black women have to have this image when on, across all of the 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 real housewives franchises they fight like girl have a seat so yeah you know, I just, plays into like that, that deeper like that, that deeper narrative where it's low key you've been taught to hate yourselves and anytime black people show emotion you, we're not you doing too much you bringing down the race and it's like that's right. that like we get, we're problem. human we get angry we fight yeah that narrative it's a natural is emotion Agreed. so yeah I, yeah i ain't like that shit and i hope this is robin's last season girl because i don't Ooh, pers- you I'm wish pers- else is. I wish, like, she needs to be demoted to a friend, girl, because you literally bring nothing. Like, you should be lucky you're still getting, like, a full cast member salary because you bring nothing to the table. You never have. And I know she's from Baltimore, and that's supposed to be. And I actually worked with Juan Dixon's um, sister when I, I'm in my last job in Baltimore, and we had a very... Um, um, tense relationship, co-worker relationship, but yeah, I, so I remember before the show had came out, I remember she would talk about them filming and stuff, but anyway, that's a side story, but yeah, girl, you bring, you, for you to be from Baltimore, you bring nothing to the show, sis, like, you need, you need to just be friend of Giselle, and speaking of that, Giselle, you need to get off the show, because you, like, nobody cares about your storyline with, um, Jamal, like, it's, it's not juicy, it's not interesting, it, like, we don't care, we do not care, I mean, I hope that you don't get back with him, but based off of, you know, the choices that you make for your makeup and clothes and hair and stuff, you don't, you just have a track record of not making good choices. So you'll probably be back with him again, against your father telling you the real. But anyway. Uh, the way you just read her out, I no. wish whoever that Because you can't, you really can tell that she thinks she is that girl and it's like, actually sis i see sis girls from with less access to res with lesser access to access to resources than you that bring it through and you think just because you lie and you got hazel eyes that it's over for you and it's like sis it could but it's not and we need to sit down and stop trying to perpetuate stereotypes about your dark skin castmates, about how they're aggressive and they're not violent and they're out of control. When she had an actual reason to be mad, she had an actual reason to feel some type of way. Should she have beat that girl the way she did? No. But she had a reason to be mad. <laughs> Since I hear a bit of Schadenfreude in the way you say that, like there's a part of you that's like, <laughs> that's kind of, it's kind of, it's kind of like a key. <laughs> I'm hearing the key and that she beat that girl ass more than I'm hearing you. I'm hearing you more admonish the girl for asking for the ass whooping than the fact that she didn't have to get her but ass. But girl, you can't like, you can't like, even me, there are certain girls in community, you can't play with people like that. Like, cause there are people that will really fight you. And I don't think nothing about it. So you just like, now Candace knows. Like, it's like you can, like, you know, have a catty moment with a girl, but you can't, girl, you can't roll up on everybody giving, like, beat my ass. Like, like everybody's thinking about, I don't want to go to jail or I don't want to get a charge. There's some girls that, 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 could, that could care less. That will catch that charge and pray right. about it. Right. You can't, you can't, you can't play with everybody like that. You can't, you cannot play with everybody like that. And now she I will knows. say I do hope she learned that lesson because baby, I know that was embarrassing as fuck <laughs> <laughs> to get to get so quickly snatched. Right, and then it was like a scene that her of her at her therapist trying to put it all together, and then the therapist asks, "Well, do you feel like you did anything to contribute to the situation?" And she's like, "No, I just don't understand." It's like, girl, you sitting up here lying. Yeah, like girl, at some point, like. And this is something that I've had to learn personally. Even if I'm not in the like the most wrong, 
you still have to be accountable for like the energy that you bring to a situation. For sure. Like you just, and that's something that comes with maturity, but you just, you really have to be accountable for the energy that, cause sometimes you could come with the wrong energy and that could set, that could set it off. That's why I'm the girl when I feel some type of way, it's like, you know what? It's time for me to go. Or I'm going to be voguing from the back of the runway so I don't hit nobody and just be doing my thing at the back. Cause like, you just like sometimes you can bring the wrong energy girl and like it could just set some shit off that you didn't intend to set off. So you just and I'm just somebody that is just very hyper aware and hyper vigilant. Um, not only of the room, but my own emotions. So yeah. Like I said, Team Monique, everybody loves a, a come a comeback story. Monique is a very beautiful girl. Candace is a beautiful as well. But um, I don't necessarily want to see them be friends again. But, you know, I do want to see Monique um, come back. Because no shade, ever since Monique came on in season two, like, Robin and Giselle have just been at her. Or they just been trying to, like, haze her. And it's just like, girl, y'all y'all are not even that fab to be giving that. <laughs> y'all are not. Shay. You have any thoughts, sis? I know I was talking, girl, but I... I no, just, girl, listen. You you summed it up perfectly, and I feel like we had a good little interaction there, bitch. I'm ready to move on, bitch. I live. Okay. So, we really don't have, like, a main topic um, for this week, but just, you know, hol- the ho- them big three holidays are coming up, and, um, you know, I'm personally thinking about how I'm going to spend holidays, but... I guess just with me um, personally, like just on a a personal note. So my mother and I are not speaking right now. Um, And, you know, we, I don't know when we are going to um, speak again. Um, But, you know, now I'm thinking about like, you know, it, if we don't speak or if we don't reconcile our relationship, you know, what are my plans for the um, holiday going to be? Um, so just trying to figure out that out, but I, I guess it precipitated. So basically, let me just, we, I guess we just riff off each other. Um, mm-hmm. I guess like full disclosure, like my, I don't, I don't want to, um, demonize my mom or, you know, nothing like that. Like I still, um, love my mom. We're just in a, um, a rough patch in our relationship um so like just for full disclosure like my mom and conversation with me does not call me brianna um she doesn't ca- she doesn't call me by my dead name to my face um she she calls me b and i don't like that um like it's one of those things with your mom where you don't, you want to keep the peace, but, um, you know, every time I'm, I'm called B, it kind of, because that's not my name, because that's not what I name myself and who I am, is one of them things that it's like a sting every time it happens. Mm. So just a little background. Like, my name has been changed for, like, for over, legally changed for over 10 years. And the reason that I chose my name, Brianna, is because, um, you know, it was closest to my dad name. And I kind of wanted to, I I feel like Brianna, but I kind of wanted to do something to um, honor my mom. And no shade, I, I feel like I did it because I feel like it would be easier for her to call me that. Mm-hmm. Well, and, you know, over time, you know, that just has not happened. Like, I'll hear her use Brianna, like, if if she's talking to, like, a third person, like, in reference to, like, um, medical stuff, or, like, if, if she needs me to do something for her, like, and I ha- we have to interface with, like, a third party that's not related to us. Um, and then she'll write, like, when she sends me cards and stuff like that, she'll write, you know, Brianna on the card or something like that. But, bitch, you know, I've never heard, like, my mom call me Brianna to my face, like, in conversation. Like, it's always B, 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 B. And, like, girl, I'm not gonna lie, girl, it makes me feel buck. Like, it makes me feel buck. 
And I guess um, last week I had to go home um, for a situation. And like, girl, it just, I don't know, for some reason. And then it was a situation where we had other family members like coming in and out of the house and they're not, and they're family members that I don't necessarily like fuck with. Right, and, like, right. My mom has started calling me B so much that they think that it's okay for them to call me B. Right. Then, so they think that this is a pass that extends to the rest of the whole family. So right. that it, now it's starting to affect how you're getting treated. Right. So, and it just like, you know, we didn't fall out or it wasn't like, that's what I was trying to avoid because. I'm the type of person I like, I can be very patient, but I have a tendency that when the bucket gets full, bitch, like I go off and I feel like I was getting to that point. And then I felt like I was getting, I don't know. Some, I don't know. Sometimes you just get to that day where like you move, like you get to that point and then you make a move in silence. So it wasn't like we didn't we didn't have a, a fallout, but my anxiety was so high, and I felt my like I really felt like if she would have called me B again, I would have had a moment. So my first instinct was like, "Bitch, get out of the house, go home." Now, now you live close enough, so just go home. And you know, I like I didn't like I didn't want to have an episode with my mom because you know even though I, I feel like I would have been right, like, that's a very violent energy. And I'm, like, as I get older, I'm always somebody that wants to be able to, like, really explain my emotions or ha- or how I'm feeling without me having to always, like, you know, read a bitch or get a bitch together or do any of that. But I don't know. I just had to get out of that environment because no shade, girl, like, it kind of, like, and then, it, you know, it was other issues going on um, with my mom in reference to stuff that she's dealing with that I, you know, I won't talk about on this podcast that um, have been really concerning me. But I don't know. I just really feel like, I don't know. I feel like with a lot of these issues, I feel like, especially as a trans like person in a family, you really get gaslit into like thinking that it's not as big as you are making it seem. Oh, yeah, it's never as big a deal as you're making it. Right. You're like, never, oh, no, you're always this, overreacting. This is you, or, oh, no, like, you need to give them time, or, oh, no, they still really love you, and, you know, all of these things. Um, but I don't know, I just felt that spirit in, in me that was like, bitch, get the fuck out, get out. And I'm not going to lie, I had anxiety, like, my first couple of days of being back home because I was scared to then, because I made up a lie for why I left. I didn't, but I also didn't want to say the real reason because it was family there. And, like, you know, even though I felt some type of way, I didn't want to embarrass my mom. Right, because that's still your mom, and you love her, and you don't want it to be. Also, too, because of the reason you were there, you did not want it to be like, I'm leaving in an unsupportive way. It was, right. I have a reason to leave. And I also, more importantly, this isn't the forum. Because forum right. is Because right. I feel like as we talk about um, this, this situation, this conversation of unpacking how to have this conversation with family, and particularly... The, the effects of not having the conversation and how like there's still some catharsis in a blow up in the fact that at least you got to say what you needed to say. But sometimes these quiet, these quiet armistice, these peace treaties to nowhere will have you in a situation where for years you're being hurt constantly by things you're not addressing. So I like where you're going with this. Right. So yeah, I did, yeah, I didn't want to embarrass her, her, but you know, when I came home, like I, as soon as I got back, you know, it was like, oh, I can breathe because it was like, bitch, I can be me. And I'm not like because every time I'm being called B, like, like it's like a mac- microaggression of me constantly feeling like my mm-hmm. identity is being challenged. And like, even though it's something so small over time, girl, that shit starts to build up and it starts to eat away at you. Um, So I call I ended up once I got over my anxiety for leaving. Uh, I called my mom. She sent me straight to voicemail to at least try to, and I, 
to at least try to explain why I did what I did, but you know, she wasn't trying to hear me, but like a constant theme in our relationship is sometimes I'll be ready to talk about like important stuff with her and she either is too much for her and she doesn't want to talk about it or she, you know, constantly procrastinates about it or it'll just be like one big conversation that we won't come back to ever again. And for me, that's not the type of relationship that like is going to work for me. So like I said, I'm not going to push. I'm not going to, you know, reach out like I'm going to be over here. And like I said, I don't hate her. I don't love her. But um, me and my mom had fell out like two years ago. And it was like around, you know, my transness and not even, well, it's probably her accepting my transness, but it, it was... It was about her, the gist of it is about you being an ally for me when I'm not in the room. Because, you know, it was a situation where she was talking to a family member that I don't really care for. And, mm-hmm. you know, there were wrong pronouns and um, okay. I was being dead named. So it just, like, again, gaslit me. Like, you're selling it to me like we're good and we're here, but your actions are showing me that this is a problem for you. You know, I think that's a very important topic um, to extrapolate out from this. This too is the notion that sometimes our parents can be detrimental to our mental health and can actually uphold a lot of toxicity. Um, I wrote a post recently about stickiness and the notion that somebody, people will not make a declaration or they won't necessarily, they'll do the bare minimum. It's almost like how white people do with racism. They'll do just enough for you to feel uncomfortable, but not enough for you to be able to complain. And what, what it is, is now this low level microaggression is happening over and over and over and over again. And I am, I am passively the recipient of this microaggression that, you know, bothers me. You know bothers me because you know your child. And if you know me in the, all these other ways, then you know that this is bothering you. But you feel like this is a privilege that you can take, again, because you're my mother, because you're my parent, because you're an authority figure, and you want to make me feel uncomfortable just for surely the fact that you feel like you can, that sense of entitlement. And unfortunately, what you end up doing is provoking your child or your, your family member to now have an emotional reaction And you're going to be able to say, well, this came out of nowhere. What could this be related to? How could you react this way? When actually there have been numerous offenses over a period of time, slights that I ignore because I choose not to fight with you because of how much I love you, but because you're not really being able to be open and and empathic and look at me as a whole person. And you're wanting to see me as a possession of yours that's out of alignment almost like organizing things on a desk. If I'm out, if I'm not in the position you, I'm supposed to be in, you feel like I don't have to acknowledge that you're not where you're supposed to be. And that is problematic. And I feel like a lot of parents carry that, particularly in black community, this notion of I brought you in this world and that because so because of that, I can mistreat you. And unfortunately, Brianna, I can identify with your story a thousand percent, particularly around family and, and and them taking and picking and choosing when to be an ally and when to be against me. And it really is something that to this day, I I think less less than ever before, but it's still to this day, I wonder how they really feel because there are times where they will allow someone else to mistreat me. And right. I will have to then wonder, so then what was that? Like if we're okay as a family and then somebody does something that I know affects one of my family members, I'm turning the fuck up. But the fact that you're not is telling. It says more about how you see me than, the, than the, how disrespectful they are for offending or how ignorant or how much time they need. But oftentimes our families will use, will let other people mistreat us in tacitly to align in, in, in tacit approval with their tacit approval because if it were really were that you were an ally no one should be able to make your child feel uncomfortable and unwanted and unloved and unappreciated and unseen if you feel that way if you feel that they should be seen so how can they be unseen by somebody else unless you yourself actually don't see them and that's what our parents miss and your story really just touched on that because that stickiness 
that feeling, that residue will never truly wash off. It never truly does. And I, I, if that is the thing that gets people, that, that causes people to kill themselves. That's the thing that makes people hate the holidays. It's that stickiness. It's the idea that these people said they were going to unconditionally love me, but now our love has conditions. Because if it's truly love, you would love me in the way that is going to be received the best by me if you really wanted me to receive the love. But because you want to hold and control it and mold it to be whatever you want it to be, you now are trying to define the terms of a relationship like I'm a child still and I'm not. Right. I'm grown. And you don't get to define the terms of how I engage with you. And if you're choosing not to see me, you're choosing not to see me in person. I'm not coming over there to be unseen. That's not happening. And I, so I can completely understand you wanted to be alone. I had to make that stand for years, sis. And it finally got to the place where my parents were like, what, can, what will it take to have you back in our lives? And then now we, then we were able to come to the table with an understanding because I don't have to fucking be here. Right. And, and I just wanted to get to a place where it's a continuous um, conversation. And, you know, and, and that's not to say that I'm the most perfect person. I'm a bitch. Like, at, but at the end of the day, girl, like, I, I'm at the, it's, as you start to get healed, like through there like as i'm you know i'm starting to get healed through therapy and my spirituality you know i have to take the account of the things that are not working Mm -hmm. or just like even in our relationship bitch this is like i want to be in a relationship with you but you know my inability to trust you because of that stuff that you do in reference to my gender identity it makes me distant but also, I don't want to go through the motions. Like, that's not, that, I don't want that in any relationship, whether it be my mom or my man or my friend. Like, I don't want us to just go through the motion. And I feel like, you know, especially with me coming off of being sick and stuff like that, we are just going through the motions to save peace. But, like, I'm still feeling some type of way. But And I'm at that point where... I don't, her, her full acceptance will be nice. Like, I'm not even going to sit up here and lie. But if you don't see it, I'd rather you be real and say that you don't see it. Now, our relationship will change because I have to protect myself. Like, our relationship will change, but I would like it more if you said that you don't see it because so that way you can continue to have all the conversations you want where you he, he, he me down and dead name me and like don't stand up. For <coughs> you think she did that? You think she he's you when you're not in your presence too? I know it. Like I, I feel it. Yeah. Because, because you know, I can always tell by how comfortable how uncomfortable like other family members feel when they come around me when they see me it's like mm-hmm. oh you're not really setting the stage to like you know fa- you know facilitate this no i completely understand because i know that feeling where you've called you dead me name me so much that that's what makes it so hard for them right because it's like they only have to remember to call me this when i'm around because right. if they, if it were a practice, it wouldn't be this hard. But it's hard because you don't see, they don't see me but once every blue moon. But all the years in between when they're just interacting with you, is he doing fine? Right. And he's over there doing this. And right. he, 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 he. And so now these people feel like they're being asked to be a performance and they're doing poorly. And they're failing at the performance that you, because it's still a performance. You, they're, you did not prep them that they were going to have to perform because you don't do it. Right. And that's the real gag. The only reason why these people after all these years of struggling is because you struggle. Right. And you're not enthusiastically saying, this is my daughter. This is my child. If you can't get with it, then we're going to have a... Like, it's not that enthusiastic. It's just like, well, you know, like, this is where she's at and da-da. And it's like, sis, that's not getting the point across. And you know what? I'm not going to lie. I thought I was over her relationship with my particular aunt that was very transphobic to me. Bitch, I thought I was over it and I'm not. Really? So it bothers you that they're even... But you know, that's a sister thing. Like, is is, is that... No, like, I'm not as mad, but I'm not gonna lie, like, it just, like... It does bother you. Yeah, my human... It bothers me. 
So now it's for context for the listener, this particular aunt, it's not that you just don't like her because you just don't like her. It's, mm-hmm. it's because she specifically has an issue with you. Yeah, well, she has an issue with my transness. Um, when I graduated from Morgan many moons ago, you know, I was open to, you know, inviting family into me. And um, I had a big graduation party that my mom threw. And I invited her to the graduation party and she sent the invitation back with like a daily bread verse, um, highlighting, you know, the homosexuality verse and some Bible verses. And then when I tried to call her to talk about it, like she hung up in my face multiple times. And like ever since then, I've really never been able, like it was one of those like excommunication things. And it's kind of like this been this big open secret in family and um and she basically you know stopped talking to me so when the situation happened like right before I got sick where my mom is telling her about my life in Chicago but you're saying oh he did this and dead name is living in Chicago and I'm like dead name is not living in Chicago bitch I moved to Chicago is Brianna Cause you've been this woman now for more than a decade. Right. Like, so like, like in the face of blatant transphobia by misgendering me, like this is what you're going to, and let, let me, I don't think it's that I'm not over it. I just think that it's always going to be a sore spot for me. Like, it's just all, you know, it's always going to be, um, a little tender for me and it just, and then you know i've talked to my mom about it and she you know she really feels like she's in the middle but it, you know it kind of makes me feel some type of way but it's like well you're not really in the middle because you really don't really have a real relationship with me like you have a whole full relationship with her but you don't you know you don't really have a relationship with me so like i i don't think you're in the middle i think it's like a 70 30 mm-hmm. So, but, but like I said before, I would, you know, I like, I'm at peace now. Cause like, I don't have to worry about somebody misgendering me or dead naming me, but I will be more at peace if she was just to say, I don't accept it. I don't see it. Um, you know, it is what, it, cause at least like for me, it's just the inauthenticity, inauthenticity. Like that's what burns me. <laughs> Mm-hmm. And that's why you keep calling it gaslighting because it's telling me there is no problem when there is right and i can feel it and i can see it in your action like that's the part and then then like and then no shade girl, it starts to make you go crazy because mm-hmm. it's like am i overreacting like am i de-? and then i'm kind of used to getting like the villain edit in my family or like being the black sheep or oh, she's just too sensitive, or she's going off, or, you know, and my mom has even really characterized me, like, you're mean, like, you're just really, really, really mean, as if to not take into the account a lot of the traumatic stuff that I've been through, you know, which shaped my perspective on life, but it would just be... And that that, that probably were directly connected to her particularly, so it's right. like, I mean, why? Let's get to why, mom. Right. <laughs> <laughs> let's unpack that (laughs) right but you know i've been you know but i think i'm at peace with the fact that i'm willing to be a villain if it means that i get to create my own peace Mm -hmm. or i get to get away like i i think that i'm over um I'm over trying to be good in their eyes. I'm over trying to be good for people that are not invested in my um, mental wellness and well-being. So if if I have to be a a villain to get peace and to surround myself with people that I don't have to worry about them dead naming me or misgendering me or that, that being like a major point in contention where we just can't be in relationship with each other, then I'll be the villain. Mm -hmm. I'll be... it requires it requires like I'm not gonna act like what I did was not selfish because it definitely was, but I think living the lives that we live, you have to be selfish in that regard to save your life. And and so then that's what I think people don't realize too. Like, yes, it is always identity is a selfish thing. How you choose to feel is the one thing about your motherfucking self in this entire world that no one has an authority on but you. 
that is a selfish thing. And I feel like the idea that people want us to share our whole identity with them and get, let them have input or let them choose, pick and choose how they engage with us as human beings is preposterous because there's no way that you could, cho you could choose any other experience with your mother than mother child. You could never want to be one of her friends. You could never choose to address her in a way that made her feel uncomfortable. You could never make her feel a certain way. But it's because why? She is the adult in her mind and you are the child. And I think the foolish thing that parents, the mistake that they make is to assume that you, because you're grown and you're an adult, that your child never grows and that there'll always be a child to you. But here's the reality. They may be a child to you in the sense that you brought them in this world but they're grown as hell and they have a choice on how and when they engage with you. And if you want to die alone, that's the best strategy. That's the best strategy is to make somebody feel like being in your presence requires that they can't be all of themselves. That is how you end up alone because identity is that selfish. That is the one thing you can do to somebody that will almost guarantee that you die alone. And that is making them feel like they, aren't, they can't be themselves around you. Because that is like the one thing as human beings we can't give up is our sense of self. And whether you agree with my sense of self is of no, of, is of no consequence. It is my sense of self. And if you want to engage with this being and say you love this being and get the privilege of being able to say you're part of this being's life, you have to get with the program or you will choose to find yourself in a world where this being won't want to be around you or put up with anything that makes them feel uncomfortable. Because what I refuse to ever fucking do is be fucking uncomfortable. I can't. I'm too old for that. The one thing that I can do in my life is choose my own comfort. And if that means that I'm leaving three o'clock in the morning with my luggage away from a family dinner after Thanksgiving and I'm telling all of y'all to fuck off and I'm not coming back, then that's just what it is for me. Right. But <laughs> so but before we can even get there why would I show up to the dinner so for those parents out there who are wondering why your trans child has kind of distanced themselves think back to all the times you made them feel like who they was was an embarrassment think back to all the put your hand downs don't sit that way why are you talking like that think back to all the reasons why your child could be mean before you just label them as mean or traumatized or triggered or aggressive. Think back to all of the shit you might have done to beat it out of them or to make them feel shame on what, who they are to make them mean before you just call them mean. People are mean for a reason. And so then it says more about you for raising mean children. Then you see what I'm saying? Like, what does it say about you that you raise mean children? How do you think mean children come from? Mean children come from homes where they don't feel loved. So why am I mean again? And sometimes it is, and then other times it's not even being mean, it's me creating boundaries and not and not letting people walk all over me and feel like they can treat me any type of way I want. You know? Exactly. That's what it really is. And that's what they don't want to hear. But I'm triggering, I'm trying to trigger some people that like to throw that, that word mean around. Because our community gets labeled that y'all mean, or I thought you was going to be mean. I can't even tell you even how professionally or personally people say, oh, I thought you were going to be mean. And it's almost like I thought you were going to be a wild animal to me. That's almost like what it feels like people are saying. Like, because we have this gender, just gender variance that we're not like everyone else, that somehow we're crazy. And they play into that like backdoor kind of mentality that this is all a mental illness to kind of make it like well you know you just get so aggressive oh well you just get so mean it's kind of like how white people do black people anytime we have an opinion you're getting aggressive you're getting mean well black people sometimes will signal and actually dog whistle using some of those same mentalities to make trans people like they're crazy and family will play that mind game with you it is not a my i am not flipping for no fucking reason it's because i feel unwelcome and uncomfortable by the way you're treating me and it may not be that you're saying anything mean but if you're disrespecting me in earshot if i'm in a place where i feel like i'm unseen then why the fuck am i going to be there and what you're actually doing is putting me in a very violent and unsafe place you don't have to put hands on people to make them feel violent and I want to just advocate for that now because more than anything, I think our community deals with the feeling of being unseen, ununderstood, unfelt, unappreciated, because you still want the value of me as a family member. You still want to be able to call me when you have want to know about hair or when you want to know about makeup or you want to call me when you want me in your life that it, in a way that is convenient.
but you don't want to deal with me holistically as a person enough to advocate for me when I'm not around. So what happens is now I'm operating, I'm moving around family and family is the most unsafe place to be. Right. Why are we not coming home? Because family is the most unsafe place to be for me to be right now. And I'm the type of person like it's certain family members that I have one-on-one relationships with because they get it. And it's not this big chore, and they go out of their way to make me feel comfortable. But as yeah, far as um, just every rule for sure, yeah. As but as far as like some big family event, like no, ma'am, like I will not be there because that that's like that's like throwing a match, like throwing a match into like a, a canister of gasoline. Like we're just not even going. And I don't. And it and girl, it's gotten to the point where, you know, and this reason is like one of the reasons like one of the 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 wrongs in a relationship with my mom but um you know i don't feel i don't feel safe at at my um house the house with my mom i don't feel comfortable and it's like i don't need to be there like i now i am an adult like i physically don't have to be in the environment and i don't want to be there so like but yeah, fa- like family for me, and I'm pretty sure for other people, is, is not. Excuse me. Bl- blood family is not the safe um, place for me now. You know, chosen family, you know, is that's where I feel safe. Like with you and T. Air, my sister Paige and Derod, um, and t- like all of my other, you know, sisters, like specifically in community who, you know, I have that I'm in relationship with, like those, you know, those are my family bonds. But as far as a blood family girl, I can't even remember the last time I've been to, um, I've been to like a large family event. Like, cause it's like, it's just like, you're waiting for the the misgendering time bomb to go off. And it's, it's just like, I don't have time for that. Like my goal in life is to keep my mental health in check. And being, and I remember, I think I had a family reunion last year. Everybody's like, "Well, come, because everybody wants to see you." A family, a family reunion deep in the heart of the the woods of Georgia, not Atlanta, bitch. Like <laughs> hours away from it, deep South Georgia, right? And I'm like, I'm like, why are people like, why are y'all acting like? what is going to happen is not going to happen. Like, and th- and now I, I feel like you're either, and sometimes I feel like family member will set you up to have. Girl, gonna say it. Like, so I, they want to see the fireworks. Time. It's like, they want to see you go off because it's like entertaining for them not knowing that, bitch, that can make you, that interaction can make you suicidal as fuck. For real, especially because I'm in a situation where I'm now also as a, and I, I used to teach a workshop called Transitioning in the Black Family. And one of the things that I talked about is, is the, the hierarchy in Black Family oftentimes minimizes the voices of people that dare to challenge the status quo. Because the, the, the hierarchy in the family is such that the family is invested in keeping this certain this certain appearance, this certain value system, this certain conversation. And by our very existence, we challenge that. And as a result, we become, it's like going home to family is like, they feel under attack by our very presence in the room. So then even if everybody's being polite because we all good country folks and we gonna act polite, they're before the end of the evening is inevitably, especially as, as family members drink, it inevitably gets to this place where now I'm, you know, the, the gloves have come off, the niceties have fallen away. And, and inevitably the, y'all are, people began to test you because this whole time they've been waiting to see what's going to happen. And you've been boring this whole time and none of the little jabs have been working. So then eventually somebody tries to test you and just flat out where he at, they where my nephew and they play games. You know what I'm saying? Like really, mm-hmm. And then now I have to sit in this moment and like try not to turn this party out and watch everyone that say they care about me fail miserably at protecting me. Oh, and and then once you drag them across the table, a la Monique from Real Housewives of Potomac, oh, I don't know why she 
um reacted like that i mean we were all excited this like didn't they do this they can do this thing where they like go back and forth with like they'll misgender you and then they'll uh-huh. play gender and then they'll mis- like to play this mind game it, it, it's just like no nah. Girl, you told the truth just then because then the back and forth is what's going on. I don't know why they act like that. Oh my gosh, I can't believe that happened. But the re- but then I hear you on the phone in the other room, child. You know, he drug him across the table, child. <laughs> right. Like it's so petty and shady, but people don't realize those that is the emptiness that sticks with us, that keeps us up at night, that makes us feel like it's all a sham and that people really don't love us and that we're not worthy of love. It's not saying I don't love you. It's not seeing me at all. It's actually like how we hear people say, I don't see color. It's you actually saying, I love you in spite of being who you are. I choose not to see you. You still my child. I just choose not to see you. That is what you're actually saying when you refuse to acknowledge your trans kid's identity. You're still my child because I have to love you because of the being that you are but i don't i don't see you as a person and to love me is not to not see me and if you can't see me then i know that you truly don't love me and that's what parents don't realize what we can never reconcile in our mind is if you know you doing something that hurts me the idea that you are okay inflicting pain on me simply because it makes you feel good means that you really don't love me not the way you think you do and definitely not the way that i need yeah, so I I don't know. I just really needed to get those emotions out to all of our listeners. You know, I would say with your holiday decisions, this you know, be very mindful of the places that you're spending your holiday time times at. Like, you know, fa- like family can be very triggering, especially if they don't respect your identity or they're always challenging. They always challenge your identity. And you know, I people should that's a good word, sis. Respect. And you can't love me if you don't respect me. Right. And you shouldn't be you really shouldn't be bullied into, you know, being around your family just for the sake of we all family and you gotta run. No, you should be in in environments where your identity is affirmed and and it's a healthy and safe environment where people are supporting you and affirming you. And if you don't, if you don't, um, go home for Christmas or Thanksgiving, like that's okay. That's okay. And you don't, and you don't necessarily have to be alone. Cause like I said, like, um, friends giving and all of that stuff or just being, being around people that respect you and sharing time. Like that's, that's important too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. And I like what you would, I like your recommendation that people go and participate in friends givings and things like that. One of the strategies that I found that was very helpful for me in my transition, like very early on, particularly when I was still very much estranged with my, from my family was I definitely went to all those community gatherings, those corny ones that have the flyer and the flyer looks outdated and you reading it. You need to go to those sis. And not saying you individually, specifically, Brianna, but like for community, you need to go to those sis because that's where the real loving is. Because everybody that's going to that event is coming because they, they with a genuine desire for love. Because for whatever reason, they feel they need to come to a friend's giving and have friends and loved ones come together. And and for whatever, and I will say, for whatever reason, those have been some of the most beautiful memories of my life. The time that I actually took the time to go to a community event and feel what genuine love feels like. Because the reality of it is we're all starved for it. And the truth of the matter is we none of us as Black trans people are getting enough of it in this world. So take advantage of the opportunities where the girls are trying to extend love to each other because I assure you it is a ball sometimes to heal an aching wound just just having people that understand your story that you don't have to go into a whole bunch of shit with that we can key and cut up and 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 read and talk about the trade and have a good time and it still be affirming because love can be affirming it does not have to be complicated it does not have to be triggering love and family does not have to be doesn't have to be something that feels like it's 
infringing upon your right to be who you are. You can choose your experience. And a lot of girls that sometimes may not think that they have access to that type of community, just know I've never been to a community event where it was particularly around the holidays, these holiday community events, that wasn't actually a very nice event where people were really, really trying to connect in love, where I didn't at least reconnect with a friend that I hadn't talked to in a while or got a number of a new friend. So it's worth it. And no shade, a lot of those community events were the only like family type thing that I've had in my life that I, you know, I was, you know, mm-hmm. I was fortunate to go to and um, share space and, you know, just have a good time, just have a good time, eat food and just um, chill out. And, you know, I'm just very, very blessed that I'm able to, you know, cook for myself and have my people over. I think this year, um, you know, like I said, the raw is coming down and me and Tona are going to cook. Like, just like just simple stuff like that. Like, it, you know, and you know me. I'm Right out to Tona. I'm a, I'm a very simple girl. I don't, I don't, I don't require a lot, but you know, the, the name and the identity stuff like that, you know, you don't want to have to, to spend your personal time, your free time, you know, in, in anxiety, wondering when that moment is going to come. It's, you know, it's just, it's not worth it. And it's, it's really counterproductive. And even when you, you say it doesn't affect you or you say it doesn't matter, it does. Because, it you know, it digs at you a little bit deeper every time. Exactly. And just because, you know, I've accomplished everything that I accomplished or I have what I have or, you know, how I look or whatever you think about me, I'm just another Black trans woman going through the same things just like everybody else is going, um, going through. So, you know, don't think, you know, don't think that just because somebody's life looks set up a certain way that, you know, that they're above, you know, that they're above even, you know, being seen by the people that, you know, came up with them or around it. Like we all, we're all trying to, um, figure it out. Exactly. And no matter where you are in life, you don't get to pick your family. So right. some of us that look like we're the most put together have some of the most dragged out crazy family relationships. So don't feel like you're alone. And, and, and But I will tell you that if you just keep living, it does get better. And there will be moments of ebbs and flows. And that's okay too. Every relationship expands and contracts. But I do want people to leave here knowing that we do support family here. But we support the kind of family that is affirming to the mind, body, and soul. We support family that supports us. And I think that that's an important thing to communicate as we go into the holidays. Do not lament about those that have chosen to isolate themselves from you because they refuse to receive all of you. If I can't bring all of me to the table, then there is no table for me to sit at. I can't leave parts of myself at the door. That's not how people work. So until I, until all of me is welcome at the table, perhaps you leave the table when love is no longer being served. So I think we have done an episode. Yes. So before we go, I would love to say to our viewers and our listeners, thank you so much for your support and your patronage and just all of the love and kindness that we get in our comments and our on our social media platforms. For those of you who have not had the ability to like, follow, or subscribe to us on our social media platforms. The time is now. We would love it if you could. We are at ATL Lioness, at Brianna A. Jenkins. I'm in Facebook. Our Facebook and our profiles are all box number 512 podcast. We thank you for all of your time. Also, for those of you who want to support a Black trans business, if you would love to see us grow and expand, we constantly have new ideas, darling. But in order to execute them, we need capital. And so if you would love to support a Black trans business, feel free to donate at anchorfm.com. Click on the donation tab and support us. Again, my name is The Lioness, and this has been Box Number 512 Podcast. I'm The Lioness. And I'm AR. See y'all next week. Bye. Thank you for listening to another episode of Box Number 512 Podcast. Grown Black Trans Woman Talk. Don't forget to go to our anchor page to become a monthly sponsor. And also feel free to like, follow, and subscribe to us on all of our social media platforms. And also, please don't forget to rate and review our podcast, Every Comment Matters. And lastly, Please, please, please 
follow and tune in for our live interactive Facebook show every Friday on Facebook and YouTube. Until next time, I'm the Lioness. And I'm Aeon. Bye.